Okay. All right, you're very welcome along to this week's Shot Clock. It's uh, very simple. We've got a lot of topics. We've got two minutes on each, and air horn sounds, and at the end of it, I win. That's right, Kieran. They're the rules, right? It's, uh, it's hard-coded at this point. Yeah, I'm up against it when the rules are that you win all the time, but we'll <laughs> give it a go. It's kind of like uh, Cork in the Munster Football Championship. Let's, uh, let's get into this one. So during the week we were talking, uh, Nigel Owens was in town, and he was asked by Adrian about, is it important sometimes when players actually have to draw your attention to stuff? Not quite cheating, it's just making sure that the referee gets to know exactly what's going on. He's talking about the offside rule as well and how it's not really refereed, but you can talk to him. It's certainly something that happens in rugby, you can talk to the referee. Well, what about that just instinct that we all have to cheat, just to steal a little bit of a march on our opponents? Yeah, it's 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 a tricky one. I think um, you know it's it's when the players like if you're out playing in a big game and you get a bang to the face. It mightn't be that hard, but people go down clutching their face because exactly that point they want to be sure that you know everybody is everybody is um, tuned into it and everybody has seen it and is aware of it. And you know you might be making a bit of a meal of it, but I think I think the the the, the cheating line is when you get a slap and it, you don't get a bang into the face but you go down holding your face I think that's the I think that's the fine line between being street smart uh, and playing right in the edge and trying to trying to get a bit of reaction out of players or whatever and loads of guys do it um, to, to going too far with it which, which is which is the the feigning injury that's never even happened which is which is cheating and which I don't like to see in the game but we're always going to see street smarts in the game and in every game and it is becoming more uh, it is coming more into rugby um, because, it, like everything else, it's gotten so important now that you have to make sure that you're doing your best to win and whatever chance you get to to highlight something that gives you a better chance to win, you're going to do it in my eyes. Yeah, there's other sports cultures in South America in particular, in Italy, it's called Grinta, where the whole notion of just being a little bit in the dark arts, that kind of nether regions where you're not quite sure if it's actually honest or not, well, you know full well that it's completely dishonest, but, you know, it's just... The referee doesn't see it, you get away with it. They, other cultures love this. Our culture is a little bit like, oh, we'd like you to be good, but, you know, don't, don't let me catch you when you're not. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's like the one with the penalties. Like, you know, it's like the fellow that gets a bit of contact in the box. He feels the contact. There's contact there. He, he makes a meal out of his dive, but it is a penalty. But then, on the other hand, it's the cheating guy that goes in there and doesn't get a touch and just drops these knees. Um, and that's where, you know, I'd love to see that kind of type of cheating punished properly by a straight red card because you, you there was no contact near you, you were actually trying to simulate. Whereas the player that gets the slightest of touches and makes a huge meal out of his dive is okay in my eyes. All right, okay, let's move on. Uh, WWE versus GAA, what the hell is this, Karen? All right, we saw Becky Lynch win uh, the main event at Grand Slam WrestleMania against uh, Mrs. Flair um, and Ronda Rousey. So... Just the show that the the show that the WWE put on, it's it's all a show. Listen, we all watched it. I was a big fan of it when I was young. I know fellas that are my age now and are still watching a bit of it because of actually just the entertainment value. We know it's fake. We know they don't hit each other, but still they're throwing each other around the place. They're throwing each other from ten foot cages onto the ground and mad stuff. But you know, could the GEA do more, Jar, when it comes to? Half-time of an All-Ireland hurling or All-Ireland football final. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a real opportunity here. And I think that like it's uh, it's not just for the GAA community to do. Uh, Brady's Ham launched their Come Out and Fight Me Like a Ham ad in the middle of the All-Ireland Club final on Paddy's Day, I think. And it, was, it was the first time that I'd seen the ad. I was like, this is exactly what we need to be doing. It's like in the Super Bowl, the uh, big ad campaigns all launch. Everybody tunes in for the ads. They know that there's like the biggest TV audience of the year watching it. It becomes a talking point. And so suddenly the sense of, okay, gets built up by the brands around them as well. I think the brands and the sponsors have a bit of a role to play here too because like, sometimes we expect the GAA to understand exactly how to put on an event when actually they're busy putting on millions and millions and millions of fixtures and sometimes that doesn't always work out so well either. But yeah, <laughs> I think it should be a collective thing and just a desire to sex it up a bit. What's wrong with a bit of sex? I know, bring it in. Like, like Seriously, like players could do with an extra five or ten minutes at halftime to rest and recover during an all Ireland final. I was... Out, Liam O'Connor and uh, Danny O'Reilly from the Coronas last night were doing an event in Killarney that I was at. And, you know, I'm sure Danny and the Coronas would, would, would hit you for 15 minutes with their top uh, absolute all-time classics uh, and have the place rocking for halftime. It's, you know, I think there's there's too little done. This year in Chile, um, when when Dublin played Kerry in Chile, they had Liam O'Connor and he was out there for an hour. There was a, a kind of a, a little tent covering him, himself and his, his drummers and his musicians. And they had the absolute stadium rocking for an hour and a half before the game. 
you know, and we have a real thing in the GA. We we'll rock in five minutes before the game because it's so boring beforehand. You'd want to go in there, whereas you see all these other things, like even our basketball games in Chile, people are coming in two hours before the game because they know there's going to be a bit of a show. So they could definitely up their game when it comes to that. Yeah, no, for sure. This next bit is about uh, a couple of uh, key retirements in the NBA over the course of the last week. Dirk Nowitzki and Dwayne Wade are two names that even casual fans of the NBA will be fairly familiar with. Dwayne Wade was a uh, partner in crime to LeBron James when they were in Miami winning titles, and it seems like they did that deal as part of the dream team. I don't know if that's actually the, the truth, but Nowitzki, though, is this amazing story. Like He's a giant of a man who's actually German who managed to win the hearts of Dallas. Yeah, and like Nowitzki is 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 a Hall of Famer straight away. He is um, an amazing talent for a guy who's seven foot, as you said. But he's he's one of the best shooters of all time that ever played it. You know, we always had a saying here about Larry Bird that he was the baddest white man to ever play the game. But uh, Nowitzki Nowitzki puts it right up to Larry because um, just what he did and the amount of points he scored over his twenty years, the longevity of his career. Um, and he was just such a go-to player. And, and look, he's famous. I backed him at 16-1 to 1 to win the World Championship when, when he, the year he won it, when they were in the, the Eastern Conference semifinals. Uh, they were just a team of veterans. They Jason Kidd, J.J. Barea, Dirk Nowitzki was obviously their star. They had uh, Terry, uh, Jason Terry shooting trees. They just had this team that I said, if they get hot and make a run, and they actually beat LeBron and Dwayne Wade in LeBron's first year in Miami. So them two have crossed paths. When Dwayne Wade won his first championship in 2006, he beat uh, Nowitzki in the final, and they were slightly fancied, the Dallas boys that time. But in that 11, in that 2011 series, what Nowitzki did that day uh, against that dream team of Bosch, LeBron, and uh, Dwayne Wade was was truly remarkable. He, it, it, all these guys played big, but he really, he really took the game and he took all the pressure shots. Why, why is Wade going to go down though as somebody who really won the hearts and minds of people? Wade. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I don't know if you saw it. I, I tweeted something yesterday just about, you know, uh, we see all these guys in the NBA and, we, and, you know, we hear about them and there's stuff on Bleacher Report or TMZ if they do something wrong. But what we often don't hear is all the good work they do for their communities and, 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 and the people around them. So he's been swapping jerseys all year with all these players and they had all the jerseys up. But what they did yesterday is they surprised him. They brought him into the arena and they had five people. He didn't know who he was meeting. They had five people come in. Uh, one of them was was uh, a sister of, of a kid that got shot in Las Vegas in the shootings that time. One was his mother who was in jail and who Dwayne kind of kind of came to her rescue and and, and saved her. Uh, but lovely stories. Five guys that Dwayne Wade had bought one of them a house after a fire had gutted their house. Uh, he brought he, he put one of the, he put the girl through college whose brother had died in Las Vegas. Um, his mom obviously saved her life, but it was a lovely touch because we don't often see the stuff like that from from. Um, it's not reported on, so it was lovely to see it. But their two of them are all-time legends, uh, and really went out in different ways. Dwayne, everybody knew all year he was going out. He was swapping jerseys into the every game. There was a carnival atmosphere. He was signing jerseys for half an hour every time he left the stadium. Dirk said nothing. We all knew he was probably going to retire, but he just comes out and uh, yeah, I watched his speech. He was he was quite emotional during his speech, but uh, an absolute legend of a player. Yeah, no, for sure. All right, let's move on. What's next? Yeah, we're, we're just talking about Eden Hazard and that goal he got the other night. And um, it's it's just a fine line between how good he is and the goals he gets. And uh, has he kind of under-delivered slightly uh, in his football career so far? It's a tricky one. What, what, what are your thoughts on I think, that? I think undoubtedly that somebody who has the ability to do what he does and who does it as brilliantly as he does so sporadically has underachieved because if if you think about the talent that he has it's right there the next tier under Leo Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo and he, he constantly gets talked about as somebody who's in that bracket but he hasn't actually taken a season or taken a tournament and put the entire team on his back and gone yeah I can do this and then carried it on there was that one season where he was the best player they win the league and okay you, everybody goes oh he's about to catapult himself up to he was really good at the World Cup. He's going to be in the Hall of Really Good, but not the Hall of Fame, because he is a player who I think at the end of our career, of his career, we're going to look back and go, Jesus, if he had just been able to do that a bit more often in the bigger games, we would all have said, that guy really fulfilled his talent. It just feels like 
he could do so much more. I, I'd actually missed the start of the game the other night and missed the goal he scored. But then watching it, it was like, this is like, this guy's Maradona. There was another bit in the second half. We just dribbled past about five players and in no space. It came to nothing. It wasn't particularly effective, but it didn't matter because I'd, I'd missed the fact that he'd already scored that amazing goal, which I saw afterwards on Twitter. I think unfulfilled, <laughs> ultimately. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's possibly a bit harsh on him. Uh, first of all, he's in the Premiership where it's the most robust and competitive league. I think if you catapulted him out to Spain, I think it would be slightly easier for him against some of the some of the teams to get around there. Um, you know, he's he's he he brought Belgium to third place in the World Cup. He has two Premierships. He's he, his year in France. He won the league and the cup before he before Joe Cole. Thank you, Joe Cole, for sending Eden Hazard our way. Um, but it, it is like, are we comparing him to Messi and Ronaldo? And, and we, have, we hope he's not even going to get there. But, like, you know, there's a good chance he'll probably end up in Madrid next year. And at his age profile, 27, 28, it's probably, it'll be a bad time for Chelsea to lose him if we lose him. But I think if he goes to Madrid next year, he could. that's where he could catapult himself. Because he's had a few managers, including Conte, uh, that wanted him to hack back and track back and do mm. all this running, where I, I do think he's a bit more like a Ronaldo or a Messi, where you just sacrifice maybe a small bit of the work coming back to pitch to allow him to have the energy when you get it up to him that he's going to create all these things. And I think, to be honest, his whole career, he's been he's been asked to plow up and down the left wing and, and, and come on, Eden, give us a bit of magic. But I thought his goal, I thought his goal was, on, on Monday night was unbelievable. And yeah, he's only 27, 28, so... Uh, I think we have to hold off on the on the under delivered uh, or underachieved uh, comments so far. I'll have to stick by my man. He's a Chelsea guy. I'm going to back him. All right, okay. I'm going to give you a couple of years on that one, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to remind you about this time. I'm going to no, no, no. He never, he never <laughs> quite made it. Uh, I want to move on. I want to talk about Rory, Rory McIlroy this week. I uh, did his press conference yesterday ahead of the start of the Masters today, and the whole point was uh, I'm a changed man now. I'm not looking at the urgency that I've always felt when I got to this place. It's not, you know, my mindset wasn't right in the past. I'm, I'm meditating. I'm juggling. I've, I've seen lots of people juggling. It's, it's taking off. It's calming my mind. Maybe this is all Rory McIlroy needs. And if that's what Rory McIlroy needs, then fair play. Go and get what you need, son. But I don't know. I'm just a little bit anxious. I'm not sure that he's going to do it at Augusta ever. Rory, all, yeah. he to do, all he has to do is just putt. If Rory puts well in Augusta and he gets the feel for those greens and he sees a few drop in, he's going to be very hard to beat, Gerard. That's as, that's as simple as that. Um, uh, he is, you know, I, look, we know his famous last was well documented down there. And maybe and maybe he is, maybe he is, I don't know necessarily about a changed man, but maybe he is looking at the event in a different light because, you know, when you first get there, I'm sure when you first go up Magnolia Lane, you're kind of going, oh my God, here we go. Let's, let's, let's get this on. But, uh, I think he's kind of realised now that there's another. There's a lot of players playing this event, it, it, you know, and there's a lot of good pros out there, and it's not an overly long course, so they all get they all get brought into it, and basically whoever wins the Masters normally puts the best uh, and doesn't have any meltdown on any of the on any of the holes. So um, I think I think he's got I think he's got a right good chance. I don't know about the juggling and the meditation. I think if he gets out in the putting green, it might be a bit more. Uh, Beneficial. When you look over to the corner, Mark O'Shea is over doing a bit of juggling and everybody's like, hang on a second, this guy, he's either going to have the best game of his life or he's going to kill somebody. Is that what happens? Maybe more Tomas. Yeah, yeah. If, if I looked across the dressing room and saw Mark O'Shea or Tomas O'Shea juggling balls, um, there'd probably be a, bit of a, there'd be a bit of an argument coming down the track to get your head tuned into the game. So uh, I don't know how juggling tunes you in, but uh, that's probably the calming part of of the mind. Maybe Tomas could have done with a bit of cam, a bit of calming influence because he was a bit volatile. He was a bit volatile like myself at stages, but uh, maybe myself and Tomas could have done with a bit of juggling back. Ah, uh, you yeah, did all right without us. Uh, <laughs> let's move on. This is, a, this is a question purely to troll the Chelsea fan in you. Uh, Spurs this week, their brand new stadium, they finally moved into it. We were wondering maybe the right thing to do was to hold off until the end of the season so there'd be no disruption. Pochettino insisted, no, 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 no. There's going to be an energy from that crowd that we need. They needed it the first game. They got that out of the way. They, I mean, it absolutely worked for them in their favour. Even without Harry Kane, they managed to uh, finish that game against Manchester. Manchester City with a 1-0 win and it's half time it looks like there's a good chance they might be going through to the semi-finals of the Champions League and anything might happen at that point so I put it to you that uh, Chelsea are no longer the main club in London that Spurs are about to supplant both Chelsea and Arsenal yeah uh, I think we're just ahead of them in the Premiership still are we Joe <laughs> uh, no it's look Spurs 
like we talked about it in last week's show um, that Spurs could be the, 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 the flickering hope for, for Liverpool this year um, that if Spurs manage to derail this quadruple effort from City it's going to this, 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 this premiership game the following Sunday four days after there's going to be absolutely more watering because City will get a huge will get a huge knock in their confidence if if they get knocked out of the Champions League by Spurs, and 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 the opposite happens to Spurs, they become they become enriched by it, and they and they look they look forward to that to that game against City and and try and even kind of keep their dominance down. But the Kane thing is a bit of a worry if he is out for a while. It it, it is a bit of a worry for them. I don't see them going much farther in the competition if he's not there. Having said that, Sam has been uh, has been unbelievable this year. He's He's an ama- His goal last night was was brilliant to save it and play first, and and then to have the bit of trickery, and then to be able to get the power on, on that left footed finish. So it is, it is. They're not, they're not the Chelsea yet. They'll have to do a bit more. We were knocking, we were knocking a bit longer than they were, I think. Um, but they certainly are on, they certainly are on that on that trajectory. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would feel more secure about my future as a Spurs fan at the minute, notwithstanding the fact that. They never spend big than I would as a Chelsea fan because who knows how long Abramovich is going to be there and what happens next when he goes. Uh, so next, next is uh, Pep screwed up. Yeah, yeah. Like we're, we're we're talking about Pep and we saw him. He went to Bayern Munich and you know it, it didn't work out for him in, in Europe. Really, uh, he did very well domestically. But you know, you look at the the team he had with Xavi and Iniesta and how well they were going. They were beating United there in two finals uh, in the early noughties. But has he? Would he regret having left Barcelona? And did he? Did he? You know, have they? Has he underdelivered? Did he underdeliver with that team in yeah. a way? Yeah. So I, I was making this point uh, a little bit earlier in the week that I think that when he's seventy, he's going to look back and go, I, "I walked away from a team with Xavi and Iniesta and uh, Leo Messi and whatever else was going to happen around there because of what was happening in the background and because I put myself under so much stress, stress and strain and because I allowed Jose Mourinho to get underneath my skin. Nobody who makes that decision in ten years, twenty years, thirty years is going to look back and go. Yeah, that was that was definitely the right thing to do. I back myself still for that crazy bullshit decision that I made at the time. Now we all make mistakes. That's fine. That's fair enough. Maybe he gets to go back at some point, but he won't be going back to Leo Messi's Barcelona. It'll be something entirely different. And it, it did put me in mind of some GA managers who walked away who must have some regrets as well. You think Liam Sheedy coming back now is trying to exercise a bit of the ghosts that he had just knocked Kilkenny off their perch, stopped the five in a row with a brilliant team who were at the peak of their powers and who still had a number of years, that, that under-21 group were just coming yeah. to fruition. And they're serious hurlers. They're still the backbone, in some respects, of the tip team today when he's come back. He must be thinking to himself, if I'd stuck around, I could have stopped that next three in a row they did. That could have been the birth of a proper dynasty for tip hurling. We want it done back-to-backs for the first time since Jesus was in short pants. <laughs> I, I think I think what 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 Pep did at um, at Barcelona was unbelievable, and I think he will have regret that he left, uh, and he will have regret that he didn't see out that uh, that that group he had because it was look it's one of the most special teams of all time. Um, but like the hard one, or the, the, the Champions Leagues, like you know, yeah, that he should have probably won more when he was there, and he shouldn't have left and all that. But he still did extremely well when he was there. He still won three of them. He's Real, you know, Real Madrid and Cristiano he, Ronaldo won more than Barcelona have, and that must stick in the craw of, of, of all of those Barcelona. Fans. What? We were yeah, way I better know. than them. Yeah, I know. I know. It, do, it definitely does burn them. I'd say deep down because uh, Ronaldo, right, kind of near the end, out of nowhere, all of a sudden would would bail and then were in three and four Champions Leagues in a row. And yeah, they did. They did. But uh, I think I still think what Guardiola did with, with Barcelona and being a Barcelona player before and, and, and a Barcelona kind of to the core, uh, he can be very proud of the work he did did over there. But I do agree with you slightly that he will have regret that he just didn't stay. Not saying he underdelivered or that he wouldn't have won more or whatever, but that he just didn't stay and, and see that out. And you know, but he's cute. He's cute enough. In fairness, Pep, he goes, he's he goes right. from Bar- yeah Barcelona to Bayern Munich, wins everything there. Bar the Champions League, you know, he's in the city, winning everything. So good, good uh, man to win you the league, Pep Guardiola. Uh, come back to me yeah, later, good, your Champions League. Yeah. I'd like to see him get the Tranmere job for a year. Yeah, I, I, it'd be interesting. It would certainly be a good fly in the wall documentary there. And I was on six part. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, one of the stories that came up during the week, we had Des Curran on, the commentator from um, Air Sport, talking about 
stuff that he'd seen on the sidelines of uh, under eights and under tens uh, Dublin District Schoolboy Soccer League matches. It just sounded like uh, you know some coaches still have that old school uh, mentality when it comes to banging the hurl on the table, metaphorically in soccer instance. But like Jesus Christ, yeah. Like I, 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 to be honest, when they're when they're eight and ten, like you know, it's you know, if you get their attention, you're doing well. You know, it, ha- it has to be about enjoyment at that age. All you want to do is get as many fellas playing that are enjoying it as possible. Uh, these coaches that are shouting at kids and roaring at kids at that age would want to get a grip. Having said that, I've no real problem with you know, and we spoke about in shot clock last week with the great Tom Izzo over Michigan State who lost in the semi final of the of the college basketball. I have no real problem with coaches uh, 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 being like that with older men or or, or, te- or you know fellas that are eighteen or nineteen that are that are becoming men or uh, coming out of teenage years. But but that that younger age group, you know, has to be all about fun. Like every Sunday morning session has to be about the fun. Every game has to be about the fun. Every game has to be about getting everybody on to play. Um, what what who, and, you know, who did you respond to? What, what type of uh, manager? If you you know, would you like the cold, calculating, silent, nodding in the corner, Jim Gavin style, or do you want Davy Fitz on the pitch pushing the opposition? Um, I'm probably more of a Davy Fitz man to be honest. To get to get me going, I'd like Davy Fitz roaring at me if if I didn't if I didn't deliver or I had a bad game. It'd make me it'd make me want to come back. Uh, I, I think I could approach, you know, Davy Fitz better with ideas and stuff. With Jim is that 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 call manager that you don't know where you stand with them. I never really liked that because I'm too much of a communicator. I want to talk to them, but I get the feeling that they don't want to talk to me. So I would be I would be big on the I would be big on on the communication side of it. But I do like like you know I know we Davy gets this rep of you know there was that famous when he's banging the the hurl inside in the dressing room at UL that video that went around and there's. You know, we see him out in the pitch, and he's and he's energetic. But I'd say there's a calm side to him too, and I'd say there's a side to him that that players that he coaches kind of like about him. So, I think I think if you can have a bit of both, I think if you can be calm or the majority of the time, but you, that you know you 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 do have that you do that have have that eruption in you is um, is is important, I think too. Yeah, you can see the calmness. Um Lee Chin was talking during the week about a loss of form last season and he went down and spent a couple of days with Davey. They went and played golf and they hung out and they had chats and then he played the best game of his uh, season the next time out. You can see that like Davey Fitz, is, some of it's an act. Some of it's just yeah. to, to get things going. Some of it's to inject a little bit of life into a situation. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an, an arch genius to that as well. There is, there, is, there is an art to that and I think he's very good at it. I don't think he gets enough credit for that. We, 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 we tend to kind of get on him about the, the antics sometimes but I think there's a huge part for that about him Predictions let's talk about the Masters because obviously everybody knows you're a golf fan you had that uh, indigestion a couple of weeks ago which led to uh, you predicting accurately that Rory McIlroy is going to win at the players but you don't think Rory's going to win this week you've got somebody else for us have you? I do I just I, I, there's no one there's not too many people talking about him he's number one golfer in the world but Justin Rose for me um, always competitive around Augusta I think over the last 10 years, I read something on, on an American website last, over, over the last 10 years, he's got the best combined score. So if the Masters, if, the, if there was 40 rounds taken, uh, Justin Rose is leading. So again, I felt like, look, whoever's going to win Augusta has to have the putter on fire. Justin is a guy that can get it on fire. Um, and, and obviously so is Rory, but you know, uh, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna go with. I'm gonna go with Justin on this one. That's that's. I I I I do think it's about time he he won this. He's been very competitive long enough, and I think he'll feel that. And he and he doesn't really have much pressure on him. Bubba Watson's thirty three to one this weekend. I like that as a an each way. Just I mean. Oh, you want to see more tears at the end of the broadcast? Oh, stop. Sickening, <laughs> sickening. The fake false tears of Bubba Watson and his. Uh, oh my God! Yeah. I think uh, we we just get Connor Moan and uh, Connor sketches on to if he if 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 he wins it, we got to get him on shot clock next week to do a small bit of a, a reenactment but uh, yeah no, I, I prefer to see Justin Rose win it to be yeah, honest yeah I think uh, the only way that I can it's uh, Bubba Watson and Matt Kuchar so that at least if um, you're actually hating what you see there's a little bit of financial profit for it in you um, <laughs> Liverpool take on Chelsea on Sunday what's going to happen? Uh, I, 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 I'm um, it's a tough one I want Chelsea to win the game but you know I probably as I said last week I prefer to see Liverpool win the league over Man City so uh 
I know if we if Chelsea win, they they, they will derail Liverpool's uh, attempts, and I will get a bit of value out of that with the, with my close Liverpool fans that slag me on a regular basis and that I slag them on a regular basis. But in the long run, I prefer to see Liverpool win the league, so I'll be a bit torn. But I am going to go with Chelsea. I think I think Chelsea Chelsea are on a good run of farm and they've got a bit of momentum, so they will be dangerous for Liverpool. Yeah, for the sake of debate, I'm going to have to um, go for Liverpool. But I think you've got a really good strong case. I think that after a win like the one they've just had, for Liverpool to keep out that momentum this week, it's a big big, big, big game in the context of the league, particularly when there's been just a little bit of a slip from Manchester City. So, they, they I, I, think that, I think that might help him that it's such a big game, Joe. I think that's that, that mightn't be a bad thing necessarily that it's Chelsea that we're going to play and that we're going to have to be. You know, I'd be a bit more worried if it was a mid-table team that, yeah, we should win, but next thing if you go one down, you're in panic mode and you next thing you're saying, Jesus, we're five games to go, our season's over if we don't beat these and we're going to be known as chokers because we lost to Huddersfield or somebody, whereas... I think Chelsea, they'll get right up for it. They'll be at the peak of it. And, uh, you know, at Chelsea are going to get Liverpool's best shot. And it's and it's it's going to be, I think it'll be a very good game on, on Sunday. Yeah, Karen, good stuff. Enjoy it. Another shot clock's in the books. Thanks a million. Thanks a million, Gerald. We'll talk to you later.